If I say Hollywood in the 1960s, you might think of Marilyn Monroe or Kirk Douglas. But in reality, true power in LA's movie industry was off screen. It laid in the hands of none other than the Mafia. More specifically, one man known as The Fixer. Very few people know the name Sidney Korshak, which is exactly how he wanted it. The Chicago-born lawyer was the outfit's legal counsel, not only consorting with mobsters like Sam Giacana and Johnny Roselli, but also with labor leaders like Ronald Reagan. In the land of dreams, Korshak was a shadow among shadows, a wisp of smoke curling around the brighter lights. The tall, immaculately dressed mafia attorney was a Chicago-born Jew of Lithuanian descent who climbed from the West Side ghetto of Chicago to the glitter of Hollywood as a shadowy advisor to big business, show business, and organized crime figures, and his influence extended beyond what most people know. In fact, the Justice Department described him as the most important contact that the mob had to legitimate business, labor, Hollywood, and Las Vegas. Well, let's just say a nod from Korshak and Santa Anita closes. A nod from Korshak and Madison Square Garden stays open. A nod from Korshak and Vegas shuts down. A nod from Korshak and the Dodgers suddenly can play night baseball, wrote former Paramount Pictures chief Robert Evans. Unsurprisingly, it was a call from Korshak in 1966 that elevated Evans to the position as chief executive at Paramount Pictures in the first place. The signature film during Evans' time at Paramount was The Godfather. Director Francis Ford Coppola was determined that Al Pacino play the role of Michael Corleone, but Pacino was contractually obligated to another film whose producer would not release him from the contract. Korshak made a phone call on Evans' behalf, and within 20 minutes Pacino was free to play Michael Corleone. The son of a wealthy Chicago contractor graduated from the University of Wisconsin and received a law degree from DePaul University in 1930. His grades had slipped to a C-plus average, and, curiously, the only A's he received in two years were in partnership, trust, and property law, subjects well suited to his future successes. Within months of opening his law practice, he was defending members of the Al Capone crime syndicate, and when necessary, he would arrange for a judge to be paid off so as to guarantee the desired verdict. Korshak moved to California in the late 1940s and found Hollywood executives as eager as Chicago businessmen to hire him, even though he had no law offices in Los Angeles, and wasn't even licensed to practice law in California. Sidney Korshak, by definition, his job had to be in the shadows. He didn't want to be famous. He wasn't the kind of lawyer who ever practiced law or went to court. He just knew the law so he could advise his clients what to do. And the way he set it up was he didn't even want to have an office because that would be too obvious. He didn't want to have business cards or a secretary. He did it all himself. His reputation was made in 1943 when a mobster on trial for extorting millions of dollars from Hollywood movie companies testified that when he had been introduced to Korshak by a high-ranking Capone mobster, he had been told, Sidney is our man. In a city like Hollywood, where fame is the calling card most residents crave, Sidney Korshak shuns the spotlight. In the early 20th century, many of Hollywood's film producers had Eastern European Jewish backgrounds. They had the ambition and the talent to make movies, but they didn't have the money. That was in part because the banks were too prejudiced to lend to people from these ethnic backgrounds. So the studio heads had no choice but to turn to the mafia. And as Korshak well knows, traditional banks don't give loans to movie studios because the success or failure of a film is never certain. However, organized crime could not care less about that. They're looking for ways to launder their dirty money, so investing in a motion picture offers an ideal opportunity. And just like in their Las Vegas casinos, the mob adds to its bottom line by skimming money off a film's profits. In some instances, actors are not paid their full salary, a brutal yet effective way for the mob to make even more money. Few actors complain because those who do soon find themselves unable to work. The LA organized crime was making big money bootlegging alcohol, among other things. In time, the gang grew in power, enabling its boss, Tom Dragna, to secure a spot on the commission, the National Crime Syndicate founded by Lucky Luciano in 1931. No other individual west of Chicago was so honored. But the arrival of Bugsy Siegel in 1937 spawned a rivalry. The Los Angeles crime family was slowly replaced by Siegel and his New York connections. The first Hollywood labor unions were just beginning to organize and Dragno was slow to insert himself, but Siegel managed to do so almost immediately. You see, a Hollywood film is a cooperative effort requiring writers, carpenters, painters, electricians, teamsters, and many more skills specific to motion pictures. Movies do not get made without these artisans. By controlling the unions as well as providing movie funding, the Mafia effectively had their fist clutched on Hollywood. 
uh, typically a studio would say, uh, Mr. Korshak, we're filming a movie next week and we want to make sure there's no labor problems. He would say, sure, you know, what, what's your budget? And he, he'd write it down and, and uh, okay, I'll, I'll call you right back. And then Sydney would call Chicago to the mob and they'd quote a price. He'd go back to the studio, call them back and say, for $100,000, you got no problem. You won't have any labor issues. And Hollywood sort of liked it because they knew that everything was taken care of. They, they were guaranteed no problems. So they sort of liked Sydney, you know, they didn't mind paying it. They wrote that into their budgets, money for labor, labor costs, they called it. In fact, big stars like Debbie Reynolds, Tina Shore, and Jill St. John are just a few of the many celebrities benefiting, at least indirectly, from the power of organized crime. Kirk Douglas was among Sidney Korshak's closest celebrity friends. A list that also includes Warren Beatty, Jack Benny, Sid Charisse, David Jansen, and Vincent Minnelli. It pays to be a friend of the fixer. When Frank Sinatra's acting career appeared to be over in the early 1950s, it was a phone call to Columbia Pictures president Harry Cohn that secured him the supporting role in From Here to Eternity that won Sinatra an Oscar. It was even rumored that the singer Johnny Fontaine portrayed in the Godfather novel and movie, who, thanks to his mob connections, landed a role when the mob made the producer an offer he can't refuse, was inspired by Frank Sinatra. Likewise, when Korshak entered into an affair with Jill St. John, he convinced the actress to buy shares in a Las Vegas casino operation. This meant that when making the film Diamonds Are Forever, she will actually be part owner of the casino where the movie's being filmed. Korshak's insider information eventually makes the actress very wealthy when the Parvin Dorman Casino Group is purchased by the Stardust Hotel. In time, Korshak's client list expanded to include Hilton and Wyatt Hotels, and the Los Angeles Dodgers, the Madison Square Garden Corporation in New York, owner of the New York Knicks and New York Rangers hockey team. Yet lower-level mobsters were forbidden from even speaking to him. Sidney was up on a plateau we never really got to. One law enforcement officer recalled, it never came down to our level. We never ran across him. We never saw Sydney meeting with the guys. Sydney was always meeting with lawyers, with legitimate people. FBI agent Mike Wax later told journalists, if you were going to make a movie, the talk around the town was that you'd have to use the Teamsters. Of course, you'd better get it straightened out with Sydney before you get those Teamsters over there, or you could have problems. He'd get a consulting fee from both ends, the producers as well as the Teamsters. I wish we could have proven that. When it came to Sydney, Labor, the Teamsters, and Hollywood, there wasn't anyone who had been in the entertainment business for more than five minutes who didn't understand that when Sidney Korshak said, you will do it this way, that you did it, or it could cost you your life. In fact, Korshak's name has come up in more than 20 investigations of organized crime, yet he's never been indicted. This is a credit to his discretion. When other mafioso gathered in New York for the Appalachian Summit, Korshak thought it was too public a gathering and stayed away. When the FBI succeeded in bugging the outfit's Chicago headquarters, Korshak's voice is never heard on tape because he refused to go there. He was so cautious about security that he'd never use a telephone he believed might be tapped. On one occasion, federal agents watched in amazement as he entered a phone booth carrying a large bag filled with loose change to make a number of calls. To frustrate law enforcement officials even further, Korshak never used credit cards, often carrying as much as $50,000 on his person in large bills. Korshak was arrested only once for carrying a concealed weapon in Chicago in 1931, a charge that was dropped at his arraignment, and once entered into a consent decree with the SEC stemming from stock fraud allegations. But that was as far as it went. The truth is, Korshak's influence was everywhere, and it extended far beyond Hollywood. It was he who presented Senator Estes with photographic blackmail, pictures of him with a mistress, thus bringing about an abrupt end to the for hearings against organized crime. And it was Korshak who knew the names and motivations of Buggy Siegel's killers, even as the Los Angeles police struggled to find a single clue. He was a very influential figure in Las Vegas for decades, representing both the unions and hotel owners as well as individuals and companies trying to buy hotels there. Korshak had so much clout in the gambling mecca that officials of Las Vegas Riviera Hotel once ejected Teamster Chieftain Jimmy Hoffa from the presidential suite to make room for him. On the 20th of January 1996, at the age of 88, Korshak died of a heart attack just one day after his younger brother, Marshall Korshak, a longtime Chicago political insider, died at age 85. The funeral service was private, its whereabouts was unknown to the media. Besides his wife and kids, there were about 150 others. 
As far as underworld figures go, as far as Hollywood potentates go, even as far as lawyers go, the name of Sidney Korshak meant little to the masses. But in the inner sanctums of the underworld, Hollywood, and the law, among those who celebrated his eyes and ears the masses know and revere, the name meant much. It invoked the myth and mystery of the man believed to have represented Mafia law west of Chicago. The man believed to have controlled the inner workings of Hollywood, Las Vegas, and God only knows what else.